seminar on the subject, Babbage and Lovelace. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Cindy Padua. She is not, as is usual for our presentation, a computer scientist, nor an IT professional from a career in computing. She is a graphic artist and animator, and the author of the thrilling adventures of Lovelace and Babbage, which I must wave up. <laughs> which is a steampunk comic and a very wonderful book. She says that when she started to work on it, which was at the suggestion of an IT friend, she knew nothing about Victorian history, science or mathematics. However, for this book in 2015, she was awarded the biennial Neumann Prize of the British Society for the History of Mathematics. She spoke at the Oxford University Symposium to celebrate Ada Lovelace's 200th birthday, and an audience member commented, you do the Neumann Prize great honour. So I'm very happy to introduce Sydney Padua to talk about Babbage and Lovelace. Um, these are some quotations from quite 
very good later in, in Lovelace's life, um, sort of potential to be the original mathematical investigator. Um, this was, of course, a very unusual education um, for a girl in this period. Um, Babbage, uh, well, Babbage, of course, was um, uh, very famous for his projects to build these enormous calculating machines. Um, um, Lovely spent Babbage in 1833. Um, uh, I think originally at Mary Somerville's house at a dinner party, but eventually at one of his famous parties where he was demonstrating uh, the beautiful uh, fragment of the different center that he had. But you can still see the Science Museum, I'm sure everyone here has seen that uh, lovely object. Um, Ada first became fascinated with this machine. Um, she was already very fond of uh, engineering. Um, so she asked Babbage for the blueprints, uh, which he duly sent. Um, uh, it wasn't so much uh, that machine as Babbage's, oh sorry, this was the gag that I put in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I do gags and stuff. This is mostly what I do, is uh, stupid jokes, so I'm much better than this. Um, so, uh, it was actually Babbage's second machine uh, that he was fascinated by. Um, Babbage conceived this in the same year that he met Ada. Um, so she would have known him at a period when he was in a real intellectual ferment uh, on this machine, and I think that's what communicated itself to her. Um, this was, of course, the analytical engine, uh, this enormous um, machine uh, that was essentially a computer, um, which existed, of course, solely as all these various plans and notebooks and scribbling books. Um, in 1842, uh, somewhat complicated, uh, this is the short version for the original comic. Uh, the long version is, of course, Babbage uh, went to Turin to give a lecture on the machine, a very rare um, event for him. Um, he was strangely reluctant to talk in detail about um, the analytical engine in public. Um, this talk was transcribed uh, by um, Menabrea, uh engineer who was there at the time. Uh, Menabrea wrote up a fairly lengthy piece on it in French. Um, and Ada was asked to translate this paper, uh, presumably by Charles Wheatstone, uh, I think. Um, Ada was keen to, do, to make some sort of contribution to the machine. Um, she was pestering Babbage uh, by mail a lot, and presumably a person uh, to, lend her, to, to let him use her brain uh, on the machine in some capacity. Um, and actually, translation was uh, a perfect project for her because this was the standard way for women to, con to contribute to science at SBA, was translating uh, continental words. Um, like I mentioned, Mary Somerville um, uh, got into uh, science writing by translating the class. Um, so, uh, Lovelace translated the paper, and of course, the, the most notable thing um, about the translation is that the footnotes that she added are about three times longer than the paper that she was translating, mm -hmm. um, because she was so full of uh, sort of excitement and energy, and she, she wanted to communicate how wonderful this machine was. Um, in it, of course, uh, the famous first-ish, computer-ish, program-ish, um, <laughs> This uh, wonderful fold-out of uh, the Bernoulli um, numbers. Um, the paper was uh, published and well received, as far as we can tell. It didn't shake the world or get added millions of pounds. Um, unfortunately, of course, the end of the story is uh, Ada dies um, of uh, some sort of nutrient cancer um, a few years later, and Babbage never finished any of his machines. Um, so that was the comic I drew, uh, just a little strip uh, in an evening. And um, uh, of course, I work in Hollywood, uh, and uh, this ending was unacceptable in Hollywood terms, so um, uh, <laughs> it just didn't seem like much of a finale, so I added uh, this pop <laughs> again. Um, so they build that, they actually do build the engine, and they use it to fight crime. Yeah. <laughs> Um, this is, I, I actually uh, didn't know much I, even about steampunk in this period. Um, I, I just knew that somehow there was this thing where people dressed up uh, in hard real outfits and played around that, uh, that this computer didn't know. Um, plus 
because they were great, so I just want to do that. Um, so I was surprised. Um, I, I think I was thinking of Avengers. <laughs> <laughs>
If you haven't read Madden's autobiography, uh, you, you need to run out and immediately read it. It's, it's on Google Books or Project Gutenberg, I think, has it as well. Um, and he's this enormous character. Um, his, his body language, um, to me as an animator, um, I could just see it every every single thing he wrote. Um, so these are some the sort of doodles I made in order to construct uh, the comic badge. Um, so I was delighted after I drawn these to come across this in punch. Uh, I'm I'm ninety five percent sure this is garbage. It's not labeled the same. This is for Punch's uh, 1851 Great Exhibition Special, uh, and this is the fancy portrait of the gentleman who has been honorably mentioned by Prince Albert. Honorably mentioned, indeed, is that all scandalous? Um, Fauci actually wrote an entire pamphlet, uh, The Great Exposition of 1851. Nobody knows why he kept calling it The Great Exposition, but um, uh, basically one endless complaint about why his uh, different setting was not included in The Great Exposition. He was very angry about that. Um, so I'm pretty sure that's bad. It also looks very much like it, at least one of the reasons. So. Uh, you can notice that, by the way, he's also got there's a giant set of compasses, presumably for drawing uh, giant dog wheels uh, behind the mirror. Um, Lovelace, of course, I say of course, but um, possibly to this audience, uh, is a much murkier character. And I think uh, it was the murkiness of Lovelace that really hooked me in. Uh, you know, was she a genius? Was she a fool? Um, there's a lot of different versions of her, and there's not only a lot of different versions of her in secondary sources. Um, even in her letters, she's a completely different personality pretty much for every day of the week. Um, so uh, in a different way from that, which I found her a really fascinating figure just trying to get a read on, on who she was. Um, there's, there's endless strange and surprising little bits on Lovelace, uh, much less than Babbage, of course. Um, Babbage was a very, very, very famous and social figure, so he appears all the time. Um, whereas Lovelace was quite reclusive and she was also a woman. Uh, which means she doesn't appear in publications uh, to the same extent that Adage does. Um, but occasionally you find stuff like this. Uh, it, if you can't read it, I don't blame you because it's, uh, it's super fuzzy. But this is the New York Mirror, uh, 1833, which is the same year she met uh, Babbage, so she would have been 17 or 18. Um, it is said that Ada Byron, the sole daughter of the noble bard, is the most coarse and vulgar woman in England. <laughs> um, which is great, because that does actually accord with some of what you feel of her, that she was a bit of a rebel. She, she really liked shocking people um, and kind of playing up this slightly Byronic uh, personality. Um, so uh, just in terms of um, how I use this material in the comic, uh, it's been interesting in the whole creative process. Uh, this is um, the first ever pop up ever. Um, as you can see, this is from uh, Babbage's, I think this is actually from his great exposition pamphlet, um, where he's, he's, even though Babbage never went into detail in his public description of the machine, um, he did often describe how amazing it would be when he actually described it. Um, so this is his, uh, uh, if, if there was an error, you'd get a plate appearing above the logarithm with, with the word wrong. <laughs> He later adds, this is from his autobiography, he later adds the, the continually ringing loud bell uh, to this gong pop up. Um, so that with the Lovelace uh, found language uh, thing gave me this. So this is Lovelace debugging the uh, error of the machine. Um, and then of course Queen Victoria happens to be there at the time. Uh, so let's see how Lovelace is getting on and the cartoon story. <laughs> Uh, Lady Lovelace speaks so many languages, we're not familiar with them. <laughs> <laughs> it's a special language we're developing just for the engine. <laughs> um, I, still, I still got my computers. <laughs> I like old computers. I love the analytical engine, which I'll get to in a sec. Um, I also found, uh, because um, this stuff is so fresh um, and so unknown um, to uh, historians, um, I did find some, some really amazing uh, remarkable arguments. Um, and I originally developed this talk for Google Books, but I, I still um, shout their praises uh, every time, every chance I get. Um, because this is exactly what projects are there for. Um, this is from the Southern Review, uh, which uh, is an extremely obscure journal uh, printed in Maryland uh, in the 1860s. Um, and uh, in that, they put this um, a very long 
one letter uh, from uh, William got his name. Really, Reed, William Reed, um, who had been visiting Babbage. Uh, and this letter is actually from 1853, uh, the year after Ava's death. Uh, but William Reed writes back home, and they just printed his letter uh, in this essentially small community paper. Um, and in that, we get this wonderful, um, it's quite long, Babbage reminiscing about Lovelace and, and getting quite emotional about her death, and um, a really wonderful and very vivid picture of Babbage as a personality. Uh, and also this great little moment, um, near intimately and spoke highly of her mathematical powers and of her peculiar capability, I already said the matter of anyone who knew, uh, to prepare, I believe it was the descriptions connected with this calculating machine. Um, so this is just a, a, one of these wonderful little historical moments. Um, and just give you such a picture of their uh, friendship with people. Um, so there's another character uh, in the comic, aside from Babbage and Lovelace, uh, which is uh, probably the interest, and that's the analytical engine. I'm starting to stammer because I'm looking at the right back there. So uh, this is the way, oh sorry, this is a piece of video, but I don't know where it is. Anyway, you all see them. Uh, yeah, the video all though. But that's the that's the different gender, which which we're all so familiar with, with this wonderful, amazing uh, project of, of building this beautiful thing. Um, but uh, this is how I depicted the analytical entry in the comic uh, for pretty much its whole run. This is uh, George Eliot getting her manuscript spell checked. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is very much my own experience of computing, is this vast labyrinth. Of course, it's huge. It's the size of several buildings, and it's just all these endless corridors of, of gears. Um, and uh, I, I freely admit that I, I didn't have the least idea how the analytical engine worked, um, or indeed any computer, uh, for the bulk of the time that I was drawing this comic. Um, my troubles began when um, I got a book contract uh, to actually put the comic in paper. And of course, it was full of all these historical documents about Lovelace and Babbage. Um, and naturally, I thought, well, now I better put, I better put a section in about the analytical engine and how it works and what it would have looked like. Um, and uh, to my extreme dismay, I discovered that there was no, um, first of all, there was no visualization of the machine done by anyone who knew what they were doing. Um, I say that, and, and I don't know what I'm doing either, but. Uh, um, and second of all, the descriptions of how it worked uh, tended to be very mathematical. Um, they described what it did, uh, but not really how. Um, and as me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an animator, so I'm quite visual and sort of monkey-like. You know, I just like to know which bit goes where. Um, so these very abstract descriptions of the machine um, weren't really helpful to me. Um, so I gave myself two weeks <laughs> to uh, to sit down with uh, this famous, this is the famous uh, Plan 20. Yeah, I think this is Plan 25. This is the most famous, I think, uh, of images that we associate um, with that image. Um, and this is a sort of overview of the plan. And I thought, well, I'll just drop it into Maya, which is the software I use at work and do an elevation and call it a visualization of the machine. Um, it took me about six months, actually. Um, and, uh, oh, um, I'm not sure if I should talk about it. So this is, uh, the other difficulty is that um, Babbage's um, material is very heavily written in his mathematical language uh, that he developed for describing the machine. So Babbage's own descriptions of the machine are also quite abstract. They're also quite hard to get at. Um, so here's my first sort of uh, attempt to scale. Um, this is done in Maya, uh, and I'll get into that in a bit. Um, when I started uh, working off of this, um, I immediately found that, um, first of all, this is much, much more ambiguous than it looks. Um, you have the punch cards to the sides, but is that where they are? Or is it just a convenient blank spot on the page to stick them? But, like, are they to scale? Like, that is where they are? Um, when I started doing the elevations, everything seemed the wrong size. Um, the barrels came out much too small, and other bits came out too big, and um, uh, so it did take, I, and my ignorance was total 
so I didn't even know if the punch cards, I did originally put the cards up at the top, like a jack of loom, obviously, but then I had to move them down because obviously they'd be controlling the cams in some way, which I still don't know how to do that. Um, eventually I produced this, uh, which is a sort of, um, I, I mean, I know there's a lot wrong here. Um, the number one wrong thing is probably the, the chassis, I guess uh, you call it, the thing that's holding it up. I have a feeling would have to be much, much, much more robust uh, because this machine is designed so if any part of it is out of uh, gear, um, the whole thing would stop. So you would need a massive structure to keep it completely <coughs> stable. Um, but it should be about the right size and roughly the right shape, um, I think. Oh. Uh, and I, I think I have the cards at roughly the right place, so it's about that. And of course, there would have been cats in the room. Because it would have been warm, so it would have So um, at this point, I usually talk over the machine, um, which is actually the easiest done. Just let me show you on the critical slide. Um, that's easiest done in, uh, let's see. Um, that's easy to in Maya, so this is um, the software I built it in. Um, sorry, but I think resolution is shifted to You'll soon see why I hate computers so much. There we go. This is the software we worked with um, in the film. Um, so, um, Actually, this is an engineer card, I can talk with some detail over the differences between this and a proper simulation. Um, Maya as a software is uh, um, for visual effects, uh, which means that it's, it's, everything is an illusion here. It's, it's like the pasteboard fronts of a, uh, uh, of a, building, of a film set. Um, so you can't really do simulations in Maya. Maya is for making uh, pictures. Um, Jungle Book was built in the software, for example. Um, I actually started these visualizations not with the intention of um, ever showing them, but just to, so that I could understand what was going on. Um, for that, I sat down with the Bromley, uh, the Alan Bromley papers, um, which are the one kind of absolute critical source if you're doing anything around that age. Um, Bromley is the person who's re who really went through all of that and his plans and described what they did. Um, again, in, in that quite abstract language, um, so this is, in a sense, a visualization of Bromley, uh, much more than it's a visualization of, Ram, of Babbage. Um, but, um, so I, I just, I was making these basically, actually, let me get rid of some of these videos. Uh, because 
He never specified a really exact number of years, except more, I guess, would have been his feeling like anyone should remember. Um, so that's the store, uh, as he called it. Uh, so this is the story, the memory, uh, just going back. Um, and then this is the mill, which was basically the processor. Um, this, by the way, uh, this is even a, this is a very stripped down thing. So this is not to scale, and the gears are all sort of puffed up cartoon gears, so I can see what I was doing. Um, the actual machinery is much more delicate. Uh, but it's much harder to see, obviously, what's going on. Um, and I'm just going to turn on the colors. So you can see the colors here. Um, all right. Um, so just visually here, um, the green, uh, anything that turns green is driving, and anything that turns red is being driven. Um, they switch places uh, a fair bit, so, um, so I did that. You can still uh, see a little bit more clearly. Um, so it took three types of uh, cards to run a program on this machine. Um, there's the number cards over here, which have the numbers on them. Um, the uh, variable cards, I tend to refer them to myself as the addressing cards, because it, it, it just makes it more clear to me. Um, and these just hold the address uh, that, I, that anything should be written to or out of in the store. Um, and then there's the operation cards, which direct the machine, um, which have basically four functions. You can add, subtract, multiply, divide, uh, ring a bell, stop. Um, so um, the operations cards are quite small, as you can see, there's only been a few. I, this is not a scale for any um, um, So I'll just run through a program to describe uh, how it works um, for understanding. So, um, I'm probably speaking to an audience who's very familiar with punch cards, um, I think. So uh, the way they work on that this machine is actually very, very similar um, to the way the ones in the 60s work, in the sense that you have, um, so on a number card, you have um, 50 rows, yeah, 50, 50 columns of 10 uh, digits each. Um, and you would punch all of the holes except for one, and that one would have the number, uh, the digit of that column. Um, and then the card pushes against uh, this enormous, what would have to be an enormous array of levers. Um, and whichever uh, bits do not have a hole um, would deploy a lever. Um, the way the whole machine works uh, is basically by attaching and detaching um, uh, widgets onto the power. Uh, so underneath the machine you have all these cams turning continuously. Um, and the levers would attach basically a bit, a part of the machine to a cam, and then, uh, then they would go into operation. Um, it's incredibly beautiful and integrated, and I'm, I'm kind of very slowly working on more specific animations of them. I don't have any of the dragon I think that have been um, at this stage. Um, so um, the number card reads the number. Somehow, I, I don't think this bit is. Did that ever have any sort of descriptions of how he would actually read into the racks? And I, I'm looking at Gary, but uh, <laughs> short answers we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. <laughs> There's huge, like all of, like we don't know is probably the answer to pretty much every question anyone would have about this. Um, just because his notes are hard, it's so hard to understand. Um, it's probably there somewhere. Um, so. Uh, but broadly speaking, what, what um, the levers do is they would pick up, you know, pick, picture this giant column of gears um, uh, and also giant column of racks. So the racks are also 50 racks going up, and then 50 of these little wee pinions. Um, and then when the number is read out, it just hooks up a pinion and it turns it, say, three times or five times or whatever number of spots. So, Let's say the, the rack goes three spaces. So this goes, the pinion goes three places, this goes three places, and now you start with three on that gear. And you've got 50 of those all going at once from one card. So that's reading a 50 digit number into this memory position. And by the way, if I animated this wrong, because the first thing that would have happened would be the variable card would uh, announce the address location and get that hooked up. 
I'm sorry to get into the stage. Um, all right, so that's the number part leading a couple of places in. Um, now, uh, my personal favorite bit, which is just so unbearably clever, um, it's, it's so beautiful, this machine, and what I really need to stress is the intricacy and the genius of this machine is pretty much endless. So there, there's so many amazing parts to it. Um, and for me, my favorite is, because you have all these gears, like, all these levers, like gazillions of levers for every operation and, and tons of steps for every operation, um, how does the operator put an instruction in? Um, basically, he kind of put, pushes it all down into a single instruction. So uh, the instruction would be multiply or add, add two numbers. Um, and that would just be a single uncontrolled on an operation card. Um, and what that does is it activates these barrels. And the barrels is where the actual instructions are in. Um, these barrels, there's a bunch of them around uh, the machines are controlling various bits of, of it. Um, these are also much smaller than they would have been in the machine. I think these are 80 um, pegs high. Um, so it would have been this big thing studded with these tiny little pegs. Um, and each, you, you would have pre-put all the pegs in. So this is, the pegs are all hardwired, I guess. Almost pretty much literally hardwired on the, on the pegs. Um, and you have a wedge of instructions uh, for addition. Um, <laughs> keep checking these things. Um, so the the operations card just hooks up uh, the barrels, and the barrels hook up a section of the machine. Um, the way the mill works is they have specialized gearing for all sorts of stuff. So it's in sections like a factory. Um, I think Ravage himself used that um, analogy that it was like a factory with, with various departments. Um, and all of this is specialized gearing, which are, I, if I have time, I'll, I'll show you the point of it. But, um, so this is now selected. Let's go to the addition section. Um, and the numbers then read out. Yeah, so um, you would have pre-programmed all the cards, right? So you'd, you'd have to decide your address, punched it in, uh, and chain the, card, the cards together so that they would match up. Because there's no coordination between the cards whatsoever. Um, so you have to be pretty careful when you set them up. Um, so the variable card says, all right, pick up the number from position whatever uh, in the store, and reads it into, uh, okay, number zero out. There we go, we're all hooked up. So it reads a card into, it reads a number into the ingress. And then the ingress axis reads it into the machine. Takes the second number, also reads that in. And then the gears and then the barrels just go through their thing. And the barrels are just hooking up all these various bits of gear. Um, and this and the, the gears here are running through the instruction set. Uh, completely independent. Now once they're done, they drop that down. There's the result. Drops down and hooks up to the output, or egress, I think I would then call it. Uh, and then the address that what should be read out to has already been put on a card, on the variable card, that leads back in this one. Um, so I'll just, I'll just let that run. Yeah. Yeah, we'll run a little slow, but... Uh, so, number card reads in. The address, the, the addressing system should be in there. Um, start the operation, read the cards in, goes to its uh, spiel. Um, and I think Babbage uh, said it would take about three minutes uh, to do a multiplication, for example. Multi multiplication is one of those complex things because he broke the number up and all sorts of stuff. But, um, uh, so yeah, that's how it looks. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a marvelous machine, and, and this is, you know, this is such a travesty of the actual thing and, and how uh, intricate it is. But um, oh, thank you. Um, this, by the way, uh, I, I do like to say that the difference engine in the comic is based on uh, this software. Um, so you'll see 
It's very fun game. It crashes a lot. Um, and also, all the quarters, the endless quarters that I, that I have everyone running through is actually these bits of, uh, all these menus are each carried within them, you know, 20 other menus. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, this is actually the analytical engine. Uh, it's a good one inspiration. Um,
wait for that to come to you. So oh, you right. put the lights on so that Kevin can see. <laughs> and I can see. <laughs> Cindy, <laughs> it's, it's a question I've asked you before, but I'm, I, I, I never tired of hearing the answer. <laughs> Why is Lovelace portrayed smoking a pipe? Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, uh, there's, there's actually two answers to this, uh, to this question. Um, the first one is that uh, comment on, on ladies' pipe smoking. Um, a <laughs> colleague of mine uh, was associated with a Belgian company, and uh, the company secretary there was a, a, a lady who smoked a pipe. And this was remarked upon, and she said, what's strange about it? It's a lady's pipe. <laughs> Lovelace 
um, environment to find that sudden review bay? Yes. Um, I mean, someone might have done it and just never mentioned it to anyone, but I, I think if someone had found it, they would certainly have written about it because um, it was a real game changer. It was a real game changer for me. Like, um, because there's these two views of data, I don't, you know, depending on how you are in biology and all this stuff, um, it's a bit like that, um, you know, the duck rabbit image. Um, she was flipping back and forth, you know, maybe she was just a total fraud and maybe she wasn't and maybe that was really hated her and he didn't. Um, that paper cleared up a lot of stuff. It was an enormous relief for me to find that paper because as I was writing, I mean, I'm, this was supposed to be my fun hobby comic, and all the time there was this giant undercurrent that at any moment it could explode into this horrible um, nightmare of you know promoting this fraud woman, and you know I get buried under an avalanche of angry feminists and angry engineers, and that was uh, so um, finding that that sort of review thing was wonderful, and and I don't see any possible way in which anyone could have found it. I mean, it's hard to stress how incredibly obscure and strange this it was written to celebrate the culture of the South in the wake of the Civil War in the eighteen sixties by one guy in Maryland uh, and it ran for about a year and a half. Um, so this shows you that this thing, like no one would have been combing through this thing looking for that and all this stuff. Although the, the guy who went, um, I only recently sort of put two and two together because the, the guy who wrote the letter back actually appears in Diabetes autobiography. Um, he died the, the guy who wrote the letter died in the sinking of this uh, steamship and damaged notes in his autobiography that uh, he met this guy who was trying to get him to go back to America on this steamship with him. Uh, so that should have died, actually, on uh, this uh, ship. So, um, yeah, anyway, in answer to your question, yes, as far as I know, uh, I'm the only one to, I'm the first person to just, and I'm, I take no credit for it, I'm just, you know, with a monkey typing Lovelace Babbage search into Google Books, so, whatever. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, whether you or Don have any plans to, to carry on with this work as Don decodes, <laughs> hopefully decodes the diagrams that he has. Um, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm sure I'll have plenty of time to do that. Um, I mean, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. I mean, I'm sure it's going to be a software 
sitting on the machine. Um, so just having that, uh, you know, gives you the ability to build a gear, build another gear, you know, see how they fit together. It's, it's like Lego or something like that, just moving stuff around. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I think it's, you know, it was the access to the software, but, you know, it was also going down to 20, and it was blind alleys, wrong, 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 oh, okay, next bit, wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, and, you know, I, I built a couple of uh, pieces, but they're definitely the ones like the carry, uh, the anticipated carry there are the most clear uh, and we have the most diagrams for it. Uh, a lot of the machine, I would say the bulk of the machine, uh, we're going to have to look at Babbage's notation about what he wanted to happen. So this goes around, hits this other thing, moves it that way, uh, and we're going to have to invent it uh, ourselves um, because there's no there's no drawing, um, there's no diagram. So uh, and, and that's definitely not going <laughs> to be my job because that should definitely be someone who knows a lot more about the game. Uh, so, what's the one? Um, I thought it was a fantastic book, and I really loved it. It's such a great way of doing history of music, sort of you know, bringing these characters to life and it's kind of more than life. I was reading a biography of George Eliot, and I was quite disappointed they missed out on the stuff. They don't speak about that in um, but, 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 but seriously, I mean, particularly with the footnotes and the, the animation, I think it, it's, it, it really does animate history of music. So my question is, um, are there any other fascinating figures in history of computer you might move on to? Who's next? Um, yeah, sure. I'm, yeah. I'm supposed to be writing a book on a more general history of computing um, graphic novel, not but way less fictionalized uh, in this one. But it's going slow. Again, because I, I have to learn all this stuff, and that's a lot more stuff uh, than this is in order to, to do comics about it. Um, but um, I'm working on, I'm, I'm starting with the Apollo Guidance uh, computer, um, just because it's, that's another machine. It's, it's like the analytical engine, and it's just so cool and, and fun and, and, and novel, I guess. So, um, yeah. Uh, with simulations, I want to say, you, you find errors in the original design. Do you find it any errors in the design? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have so much errors as, like, no idea, like, uh, the gaps, you know, like, where is this? there's no room for a thing. Um, I found that a lot. Like, there's just nowhere for a thing to go. Um, and uh, huge question marks, like, Okay, I guess he's literally talking about 500 tiny meters uh, because they're, they're not like a jack loom loom can be quite delicate. It can just be a little wire. Um, whereas that those 500 meters to read the, the number cards, you know, I can't even picture it. It just seems crazy because they, they all have to hook up to, to another set of 500 bits that are also really intricate. So it's just getting room for all this stuff. That's why these machines are so big because um, there's so many parts and, and um, yeah, just trying to find a place to fit a thing, I, I would say was the main thing. The logic is definitely all there. Like there's, uh, I think you would have simply loved wires, just being able to wire stuff together. Um, but um, uh, yeah, it's just where did everything go that had to be there to make this stuff happen. So it's only good to have an error. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. And my second question is, um, was there some suggestion that Babbage asked an engineer to design or to make some of his bits, but in doing so lost the copyright to them? Um, oh, the difference, I think Doris can cover this a lot more thoroughly. Um, I don't think he had an engineer on the analytical engine. He had a guy on the difference engine, Clement, um, and there was a huge ruckus, and the, the whole difference engine project failed a lot because Babbage and this guy Clement had this massive personality clash. And Clement took um, not the uh, copyright, but all the tools. And these were very intricate engraving uh, tools for, for making the gears. They were actually invented specifically for uh, that project. Um, so when Clement left them all, and that's the bulk of the money went into building all this stuff, to build that stuff. And um, yeah, when Clement left, he got kind of put paid to any sort of future work. Um,
think you might have to shout. I think this is packing up. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, just what you were talking about with all the, the levers you need and the size of the machine and everything, um, perhaps Doran or, or you, did baggage involve clock makers? Because there are lots of yeah. wonderful clocks from that period, all full of very intricate, tiny little mechanisms. It's, uh, it really, that for me is like the biggest mystery is why did he, why did he ask the a clock maker, that's just such the obvious person. Um, but, um, I mean, that means you had a hard time working with anyone, I think. <laughs> like, uh, I don't think he did a lot of collaborative work at all. Like, he liked being part of societies and being around things, but I, I think when it came down to sitting down with someone, it became a bit of a problem. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like, uh, I think I've asked that question myself. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, the issue with the clock making was um, two things. One is uh, the, the, the dynamic range of forces. Clocks are not necessarily precise. As long as they have the right number of teeth on a, on a wheel, it will create correct time, even if the pitch is uneven. So you can have handmade parts which are inexact, which keep perfect time. For a, a machine like any of Babbage's engines, there's a vast amount of repetition of near identical parts. And um, you need interchangeability just for manufacturing purposes. And they don't have standardization. So the point about clocks is uh, it was much later, 1850s, 60s, 70s even, before um, the clock making industry introduced standardization where you could have interchangeability for repeat parts. Um, then there's the issue of the, the dynamic range of parts. If you look at the smallest part and the forces it has to sustain, then, and then scale everything up, that's what, partly why the engines are so big. Because the smallest part, not to be stripped if the engine were to jam, has to be quite big. And if you then scale everything else up, which is partly a partial answer to why the machines were so huge. Um, can I ask if you visited the Museum of um, Computing in Mountain View, California? Yes, I did. And did you, I thought there was either a difference engine or an analytical engine there that was actually completed, wasn't it, and they demonstrated? Yeah, um, that's, the, that's the counterpart to the one in the Science Museum. Yes, um, but the one here is not complete. No, no, they're both they're the same, I think they're both complete. Yeah, they're lovely. They run there. The Science Museum, the cross of the Science Museum, because they hardly ever run in the one year. Yes, the CHM is run regularly every week. Yeah, but that's now in there. Oh, Snoopy's got five. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was just going to say, if you're looking for a, a future um, different comic, um, what about a, a comic a possible future of the antikythera mechanism? Is that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, not a, like, there's no personalities around it because we don't know who they are. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Hey, me, during one. I just wanted to talk about the way that Google and I defined things that uh, had previously completely escaped people's attention. Uh, is it, have we got things right now, or are there still flaws? Oh, I mean, I think, you know, probably not about anything. I mean, there's, there's, um, uh, there's so many, like, the thing about Babbage is that he was, he was so famous. I mean, people tend to sort of paint him as this sad underdog, but Babbage was really famous and very well connected and very wealthy. I mean, Babbage had every advantage. Uh, you know, in that period, there would have been hundreds of people, you know, so many people without um, those sorts of connections and that access to publication. I mean, um, there was that Irish, uh, there's an Irish settlement, you know, this machine, it was basically a little crude Rod Thomas Fowler, Thomas Fowler. Yeah. Um, and he was, I think, from a very different class. And th we just have like a few drawings and a little publication. But, you know, I think there's endless, you know, things of mad, you know, most of them obviously are mad people in their garage. And then, you know, every once in a while there's probably something that, you know, is amazing. But it's, you know, I think Google Books hopefully will I, in the uh, introduction, you mentioned uh, sort of connections with the steampunk world. Um, has anyone yet brought out a song about Babbage in, in, in the vein of the men who will be blamed for nothing? Um, there's songs about Stevenson and Brunel and so on. Do we need a Babbage steampunk song? I, I'm desperate to make Babbage and Willis the musical, so... <laughs> Do we, uh, uh, a, 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 a request for our treasurer. Do you think that we could provide some seed corn? <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very, very much for the remarkable achievement, very unique angle, as we've all discovered. And we hope you go on to many more things and yeah. hear you come and talk about the history of computing and all the other things you go to. So thank you very, very much for coming to speak to us. And this is